Welcome to Yellow Brick Road. We are in a live stream, Yelbro Light, and we're going to do a fan request live. Uh, it's going to be some woo woo psychology, Jungian psychology in the game Persona 5. It's actually looked up before, but I just never played it or bought it or anything. Sounds interesting. All right. Before I get started, do not forget to share, support, hopefully, donate to Devin's Journey to Recovery. To helping victims of AFRICOM, to Cohen Daly, the Australian boy. Also help out some other content creators, Stevie, aka Redneck Economics, Sleepy J, Buy My Coffee, and Ali Alexandra. All links in the description box. Description box. Alright. So, like I said, Persona 5, I've heard of it. I even looked up videos on like you know, when you're like, you're thinking about buying a new game or something like that, and you're just like, let me like, you know, let me investigate to try and find the right wood. Then that several times. One time, Skyrim came up, and I was like, yes. Another time was Dragon Age Inquisition. I wasn't that disappointed with it, even though it's EA. Still wasn't the worst thing ever. Not Skyrim, but you know. It was alright. Uh, and then, yeah, I have, I have looked into the Persona 5 a bit, but I didn't know there was deeper concepts in it. So we're going to find out in this video from Weeby News. Persona 5 analysis, themes, Jungian psychology, and real world examples. Here we go. Weeby News here, and to celebrate the recent release of Persona 5 Royal, I'm going to be analyzing the themes of Persona 5 and how the game chose to further enforce these themes through the use of Jungian psychology and social commentary. And yes, this will be an analysis video based on the original Persona 5. It won't have any spoilers for Royal, so you can breathe a sigh of relief <laughs> if you haven't finished it yet. Anyways, I don't think the additional stuff added in Royal will affect these aspects I'm going to be discussing since they're pretty broad, so I figured it'd be okay to go ahead and make this video. But if there are some new things in Royal that end up changing things, I'll uh, definitely consider making a sequel for this video. And of course, if you guys like this video as well that'll also be something that um will influence me to make a sequel if i need to and i'm sure it goes without saying that this video will have spoilers for the entirety of persona 5 so go ahead and exit now if you don't want to see them and like i said no spoilers for royal i'm also going to be talking about the darker themes of persona 5 and some real life events that i believe were the inspiration for some of those darker themes so if you think it might be bad for your mental health to hear about that kind of stuff then you may not want to watch this video either but as for the rest of so i, I just want to add in like there are definitely video games with deeper concepts in them whether it's sociology, psychology, spirituality, 100%. A lot of these video games play, off, play out like, like movies, for sure, where there's like actual writers like writing things down, and then the writers taking things they've studied and putting them in these uh, video game stories. So, yeah. Like, if you, anyone's ever played Final Fantasy VII, like, tell me that that doesn't sound like, e like eco-activists. Right, they bomb up, they bomb fucking things that uh, they're like reactors that destroy the planet and shit like that. <laughs> but then they end up embedding in that video game. They embed like a deeper concept, like, oh, you're destroying like all these souls that you know pass through this planet are embedded within the soul of the planet. And when you're destroying the planet, you're you're kind of destroying them and and Mako and yeah. So, yes, video games could definitely have these deeper concepts in them. All right, let's go. So, you guys, let's go ahead and get into this. So just as a small recap, up, the story is about a group of teenage outcasts rising up against the injustice shown to them within a distorted society. All the main characters, including the boy you play as, sometimes called Rin, sometimes called Akira, has suffered at the hands of a corrupted adult. The overarching idea shown in the games is that everyone, especially young people, are meant to stay shackled by society's expectations of them. They're meant to blindly follow individuals with higher status than them and are forced to compromise their happiness and morality in order to do so. The Phantom Thieves all individually confront the adults they feared so much and break through the hypothetical change that once held them back. Their goal is to conform society by weeding out the distorted adults who abuse the system We'll be on in uh, 20 minutes, Tony, on the uh, Discord. The subconscious desires. So like I said before, it uses these themes and real life inspirations in order to better reinforce the themes of the game. But what are the themes? I'm sure it could be said using like a hundred different words, but the ones I would like to use are individualism and rebellion. These themes are portrayed throughout the game repeatedly through various different ways. Listening to the absolute bangers that have come out of this game, you'll notice that the lyrics to almost every song take inspiration from these themes. The primary color used throughout the game is red too, the same color as fire or blood and is often used to represent passion. They 
likely used it in this game to represent the fire in the Phantom Thieves' hearts and the passion they feel towards changing society. It also symbolizes the very real danger they must face going against these powerful adults and how they're willing to spill their own blood to do so. Even the Now, I hope what is considered in the game, right? Because if they're talking about individuality versus uh, rebelliousness, like, those are two different things. Right? Rebelliousness is contingent on, on the other. Right? You, you, it's dependent on the other. As opposed to individualism, at least the perspective I'm looking at it from, like, that requires you to, to stand alone. Meaning something you hold, some sort of principle you hold to yourself is just, it's unmovable in any scenario, no matter who's in front of you. Right? As opposed to, let's be honest, if you look into society and the normal notion of rebelliousness, it's all based on what are these guys doing? Let's do something different than them instead of let's do the thing I want to do. Let me investigate myself, find out what I actually want, and then go for that. That is, we got to fight them. China's good because the U.S. is bad. That's the watered down, like, weak version of being rebellious. Obviously, there's a better version, which is just, or a, I would say a healthier version, which is to you, like, you know, typically it's the, you know, growing up and separating yourself from all the, uh, what's the word? Adult figures or, you know, head of the households and all that stuff. You kind of want to, in a way, you want to separate from them so that you can stand on your own. But the dangerous part is what we see in politics, let's be honest. All right, let's continue. Self room in this game symbolizes rebellion, as we see the protagonists trapped inside a cell for a vast majority of the game, only to finally break free from those shackles near the climax. This whole area too foreshadows how he was trapped inside a rigged game created by someone of a higher power, just like what we see in the cognitive world, but just like there, he's able to break free because of that rebellious spirit. But like I said before, it's also incorporated into the game through the use of Jungian psychology. The game takes inspiration from these psychological theories when creating the villains, settings, and the hero's powers in the metaverse. Jungian psychology was created by Carl Jung, and there's many, many aspects of the study that are present in Persona 5. Real quick, I'm going to, going to turn the speed back. She's talking very fast, normally. See if I can make it in time for the fights. Here we go. And we'll talk about all of them when we get there. But the first one I want to talk about is the most obvious one, and that is the idea of the persona. By Young's definition, it's the hypothetical mask that someone puts on in order to better fit into any situation. It's described by the game in a similar fashion, the god of control posing as Igor, stating that personas are, in other words, a mask, an armor of the heart when confronting worldly matters. The game takes a bit of creative liberty. Yes. That's an interesting one that I don't normally speak about as often right i'm well aware of this concept it, it's I, it's less about the for me like when i focus on these terms it's, it's less about the definition of them and more about like well what's the what's, what's the function of it and something like the persona is it could be two-pronged i think a healthier aspect the healthiest aspect of it is basically you trying to showcase what you want the world to see Right? That's the healthiest expression of the persona. Right? Because there's nothing wrong with that. It's like saying there's something wrong with fashion. Or wanting to look a certain way. Or wanting to wear this particular outfit. Or these particular colors or something. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the persona. Like, with, with that. Right? There is a negative aspect of persona. Ben? Can't cross rep. <laughs> There's a, there's a negative side of Persona, which is using that mask to conceal, uh, you know, something it, it, that's multiple, multiple pronged. You're, you're concealing something about yourself that you're trying to hide from the world. And if the reasons for hiding are nefarious, that's where it gets dark, Right. We see this in film all the time, like the movie Michael Clayton, and you have uh, Tilda Swinton, the character she plays. She's like looking in the mirror, practicing poses and speeches and facial expressions. You also have uh, Killing Eve, if anyone's ever seen that TV show. 
we have the character Villanelle, right? She's looking at this little girl, right, who's in an ice cream shop. And the little girl, like, the parents like, oh, hey, honey. He's, like, smiling at her, and she's eating ice cream. Like, eh. Then vill- the Villanelle character is, like, quietly, like, ca- like, studying this little girl and studying her interactions. So, <laughs> so what she does is she, she smiles at the girl to get the little girl to smile. And she does something else. Something, like, fucked up, I think. To <laughs> Go watch the show. Go watch the show. I think it's the first episode you see that. And, uh, yeah. And actually, the Eve character is like, are you a... S- <laughs> I'm not supposed to call us that. <laughs> or something like that. Like, no one, like you, don't, you wouldn't want to be called that. Like, oh, I get that. It's almost like being revealed is the thing that hurts the most. Or someone who can't, who uh, kind of tried to bury or kill their own emotions and conscience and all that, being revealed as that thing. Maybe that's the uh, real death blow. All right, let's continue. Liberty, when using the concept of Young's persona, but overall demonstrates the main concept pretty well in my opinion. For each character in Persona 5, they are forced to confront the identity that society has labeled them as when gaining their persona. A mask forms on their face, representing the less genuine identity uh, they put on and show out to the world in order to conform to their uh, society. That's dope, Emblem. In this scene, their eyes turn uh, yellow, matching the shadow villains that yeah. they face. I'm just saying, like, their inner self is coming to my the thoughts surface. about the ideas well, that we're hearing the about it. talking to them from the inside, symbolizing that they are the true version of themselves that's been hiding all Ooh. along. Sort of like the mask, they're forced to confront the identity that society has labeled them as when gaining their persona. A mask forms on their face, representing the less genuine identity they put on and show out to the world in order to conform to their society. In this scene, their eyes turn yellow, matching the shadow villains that they face, indicating their inner self is coming to the surface. As well, you can hear their persona talking to them from the inside, symbolizing that they are the true version of themselves that's been hiding all along. Sort of like how you can hear your true self through thoughts while still holding up a facade. In order for this part of themselves to be released, they must rip off the mask that symbolizes their forced identity and embrace their true selves. It appears that it's a pretty painful process as well, with a substantial amount of blood coming out of their face. I think this could symbolize two different things. Firstly, I think the implied pain is to symbolize how difficult it is to come to terms with your true identity, but I think it could also represent that even though your mask is a less genuine part of yourself that you put out to the world, it's still a part of who you are, so the skin and blood that comes off along with it could symbolize removing that small portion of yourself. So as you can see, not bad, not fuck. I have no, no disagreements there. Yeah, the pursuit of the true quote unquote self, like that is not only intellectually draining, but also like, like energetically draining as far as like trying to find or figure out or you know navigate this that type of thing but you know if you're a weirdo it's actually kind of fun but at the same time you're going you're going to get the uh <laughs> you know it fun doesn't always mean yay fun could mean i got to carry you know 50 bags of cement today <laughs> but it's like a like a grind like yeah i fuck it like yeah, but it's dark and cold and shit. No glory. All right. Uh, and then also the persona. Yes, you want. You know, look, all these layers, even though I put them in words, I separate them in words. I'll say like persona or ego or super ego or shadow or self or uh, anima, anima, subconscious. I like I'm separating them by words, almost implying like layers. You know, but that's just so you can like kind of intellectually study it. But in reality, all of it is the self. Guess what? Even when you're faking it, it's an aspect of the self. This is the self not being the self. <laughs> you would hope that it would, you know, it would kind of condition those, you know, ego layer up condition those levels the ego super ego persona uh, condition them to be more aligned with like what you actually want to be and who you actually are i think they're the same thing 
The thing you want to be is the thing you actually are. Got to uncover the dirt. All right, here we go. Oh, no, I might not make are it. are still a similar thought process to Young in terms of the persona as a mask. Regarding the idea of the summer persona, though, the game does take some creative liberty. In the game, their persona is their true self that they can use as an armor after ripping off their mask. So even though the summonable personas in Persona 5, by definition, are basically the opposite of Young's idea of the persona, they do still try to incorporate it by presenting it as something that you can use to face worldly matters like Young would describe it. Each awakening scene as well focuses on the individual's unique struggles and the power from within they use in order to rise against them. The mask they wear in order to fit in with the society was created by being oppressed by those higher than them and even compromising their own morals or personality for what the oppressor would refer to as the quote unquote greater good. Like for example, now. The. <sighs> The origins of the persona, it's, they're going to fall right in line because they're a part of that, that ego, ego level and up, like ego and more and more shallow, that makes sense, or more and more outer directed. Uh, so it naturally is going to have the, the features of something, you know, in regards to like, it's going to have similar features as the ego itself. But that doesn't make it automatically bad. I don't, eh, I don't know if the game's actually saying that or not, but maybe, maybe it is. Here we go. Hamakoto needed to work with the obviously suspicious Kobiakawa in order to satisfy her sister's high expectations, or Haru, who was going to be forced to marry someone she hated for the greater good of her corrupted father's company. It's very anti individualistic, so seeing them embrace their true selves by ripping off that mask and using it as a weapon to rebel against those who have caused them so much grief is a pretty powerful way to reinforce these themes of individualism and rebellion, in my opinion. I do want to mention Futaba here because she is a break in the pattern since she's both a palace ruler and someone who confronts her shadow and becomes a phantom thief. Unlike the others, she doesn't rip off a mask, likely because she doesn't have a mask that she wears to fit in with society, since she stays locked in her room. Instead, she has to confront her oppressed memories and distorted cognition of them. In this example, we see that Futaba runs away from her memories because they're too difficult to face, and in her palace, we see that her shadow knows the truth and pushes her to reevaluate these memories and remember what really happened. Even though she doesn't wear a mask like the others, she still was falsely cast as a murderer by corrupted adults. So just like the other Phantom Thieves, she needed to confront the false identity that society pushed on her and rebel against it. In order to take down these twisted... Mm. Uh, smart lady. Smart nerd. Here we go. Individuals, the main characters utilize the metaverse, in which they defeat their target shadow, aka an entity created from the dark side of oneself, the part that they want to hide from themselves and the world. This exactly parallels Young's concept of the shadow. In Persona 5, everyone has a shadow, but most people's shadows reside in mementos. But if a person's thoughts become extremely distorted, then it manifests into an extravagant palace like the ones we see for our main antagonist. In the game, you're able to change the heart of someone if you're able to destroy their palace. In order to destroy a palace, you must steal the shadow's treasure, the source of their distorted desires. And since the palace is a manifestation of their twisted desires, if it no longer exists, then their desires disappear too. After everything's destroyed, eventually the change sets in and the target's desires vanish. In Jungian psychology, he believes that That's the three main parts of our psyche are the ego, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious. The ego is what we as a person are aware of regarding ourselves. The other two are the information within us that we suppress or don't recognize. They're both very different though, so for now we're going to talk about the personal unconscious, which is represented by the palaces where you fight the corrupted adult's shadow counterpart. We will talk about the collective unconscious way, way farther down the line, where it fits better in the video. So as mentioned before, the personal unconscious is information stored within an individual's mind that they are not consciously aware of. This particular information is created through personal development. So some examples include suppressed or forgotten memories. Since these palaces are literally ruled by the antagonist shadow, the part of themselves that they repress and want to hide from the world, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to make the claim that their palace symbolizes this idea of the personal unconscious. I think it's also important to point out that in Jungian maps of the psyche, the shadow is literally found inside of the 
personal and conscious. Persona does take a bit of creative liberty here too. In the Persona 5 universe, the only time a palace appears is if one's desires become especially distorted, so it only really represents one part of their personal and conscious. By Young's definition, I feel like the personal and conscious is pretty big. It contains everything from childhood memories to distorted, I guess, desires and stuff like we see in Kamishita's palace. The way I see it is that this one part of this huge area manifests into the palace and only because that one part is just so, so distorted. And that's why we don't see Kamishita's childhood memories and stuff while we're going through the palace. And it's sort of hyper-focused on this one thing that's causing the distortions, which is the treasure. But anyways, to go- Interesting. Now, I would say, sort of like the personal unconscious. I don't really call it, I don't call it unconscious. I think the, I would say the, the collective thing is the unconscious. The personal thing is the subconscious, meaning it's, it's there, it's, it's playing on you. It's acting on you. But, but it's not, it's below the surface, but it's not, you know, so uh, obvious to see or blatant to see. Uh, now, like, Young is probably calling the word, using the word conscious as saying something is, you know, smelt, taste, touched, heard, right? The, like that, the ego doing that. Like, oh, yeah, that, that means conscious. I'm like, uh, I have a bit, a little bit broader notion of conscious. Uh, because those things are playing on us in real time. Quite apparent, too. Uh, so that's why I would call something like subconscious, where it's like, it's not like completely un, you're completely unaware of it. It just means it's just below the surface of your egotistical mind, right? The thing going A, B, C, D, E, like when you do it in your head, or uh, what is 10 times 38? 380. Or whatever. Or like, oh man, that song is stuck in my head. You ever, like, where you hear the words in your own mind, you saying that to yourself in your, in your conscious mind. That's your ego doing that. All right, here we go. To go a bit farther, I'd like to outline Kamashita's relation to Jungian psychology and analyze closely how the Cover game ties these scared. psychological theories to its characters, specifically the villains. I ain't scared. Survive. In Kamashita's case, we see. She talks fast, so I have to pause it. Open this. The genius of Berserk. That's another anime, right? All right. Right, here we go. See that he just Damn, like I got a minute left. There's where four a minutes left in this video. Going around to others. In public, he comforts Mishima after specking a volleyball his way, but in private, will physically abuse him over the slightest inconveniences. In another scene, when he's turned down by On, he acts as if there's nothing wrong, but shows his true feelings immediately after the interaction ends. Next, there's his ego, the part of his personality that he's aware of, which from looking over the cutscenes doesn't seem like much. He's constantly blaming other characters for the horrible actions he's done. He even goes as far as implying that it's Mishima's fault that the protagonist's criminal record was released when in truth Kamishita was the one who forced him to do so. Inside the palace, we see a shadow far more open and blunt about his corrupt desires, and the treasure the Phantom Thieves need to steal is defined as the core of these desires. In the metaverse... Or it's kind of like, I don't know. It, it, it's different words for, for all those things. Like, they're, the words she's using already, Like I, I guess that would fit with Young. I don't know exactly how he would use, like... Like we were saying the other day, where it's like, yeah, I probably heard like an interview here, and I haven't like opened his life's work up and and hyper studied it or anything like that. But uh, something like dreams. What about lucid dreams? Is that your ego now? According to what they're saying, they're saying the ego is the conscious mind. So when you're in a lucid dream, where you're like aware of what you're dreaming and you remember it when you wake up and shit, is that your ego now? Or is that your ego within the stuff that's below the surface, your subconscious, right? Not something you're just wholesale unaware of, but more of something you're uh, just below the surface. All right, here we go. 
or the personal unconscious, it's a crown because he unconsciously sees himself as the king of the school, but in the cognitive world, it's his Olympic gold medal. Sorry right, if I'm not responding to comments, guys. I'm, I'm recording, ego, recording this, recording it as, as a video. A Disgusting, I know. Here to save the school's <laughs> reputation with his talent and Olympic pride. He has so many people supporting him with expectations of him to succeed that he thinks he deserves to do whatever he wants, whether that be taking out frustration by physically abusing students or sexually harassing one of the students. And basically the way he thinks about it is just like, hey, no one's stopping me. In fact, the students and faculty are helping him cover up this stuff. So that must mean what he's doing isn't so bad after all in his head. A man of the times? Uh... That's something where I would use a word that, that I'm going to steal from Tessarian, which is Mysterium. You're Mysterium possessed. Like, not only are you in some sort of delusion, but you're also borrowing other people's delusions too to make your own delusion. Imagine everyone walking around like, you're the best, you're the best ever. You could do whatever. You're amazing. You're the best thing in the universe. Like, all these people saying that to this guy, like, those things that to where it's just delusions and they're now folding it on top of him and he's creating his own delusions from those delusions where it's like damn you are like i think the word mysterium is like perfect for something like that or you can see it sometimes you see it a lot of times with ideology to where it's like i don't know it it'll seem uh quite magical in, in certain cases especially like there's some, some people that will call themselves like I'm only following the rational side of things. And it's just like absolutely magical thinking. It's like, nah, that's, that would make me think Mysterium possessed because it's almost like you're, you're thinking of a, it's like there's a style you're in love with as opposed to like, are you truth seeking or are you just in love with this style of thinking? Which happens. All right, let, let's keep going. His shadow no, I got three minutes. The people around me were the ones. Don't worry, I'll be in Discord. Don't worry. I want to share in my accomplishments. Students who have the drive become winners. People are willing to protect me so that we may all profit from it. So I believe that he thinks that because he's helping the students get volleyball scholarships and improving the school's reputation, that these things that he does are justified. That he deserves to have these rewards, as he refers to them, in order to upkeep the school's reputation. Going back to his personal unconscious, what he's not aware of, this is how we see him in the palace. He's an evil king that treats his students like slaves. His actions are the reasons why they're in so much pain. He's not helping them at all. And all this... Now, this, this notion I'm going to disagree with. It, this is just my sense of it. This is based on me. This isn't me. Uh, this is based on me observing my own psyche and then trying to make, trying to extrapolate some type of definitions for things or descriptions of things. Yeah. Uh, in my sense of psychology, there wouldn't be some overlord king, you know, like the. Like he's truly just this bad, he's just assholes, clearly, blah, 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 blah. Like, I don't think that's the thing that's below the surface. Those are, that, those are a part of this guy's shadow of the like, like I said, that dark factory to where you got to pick out their likes and dislikes of things. And right now he's feeding on things you'd probably not like about himself. He really like, someone broke him down and say, hey, what do you want out of life? What do you truly want? And that got truly broken down. You like, huh? Like all these shallow notions of uh, a good life would probably crumble compared to it. For a lot of people, just notifying them that, like, hey, you're gonna die someday. Just notifying them of, of them, them of that already knocks these type of notions down. <laughs> like, wait, but you're gonna die too. Uh, why do you need that that fucking golden like cup or some shit? Why do you need that again? Sometimes that works with people as far as that can break that type of logic down. But yeah, I don't think though that's some deep embedded thing. I think that's so far on the surface. It's everything's borrowed. His own notion of value is borrowed. Did he create fucking crowns and robes and shit? He borrowed that. Fuck out of here, bro. His notions of how he looks at himself borrowed from other people telling him how special he is. Like, come on, bro. Like, that is poverty. <laughs> That's spiritual poverty or psychological poverty. 
to be selfless, not this is who you really are deep down. It's like, no, 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 no. That's the illusion. In fact, he's so up on the surface, so shallow. This float he's on. He's in one foot. He's in a one foot pool with floaties on. That shallow. It's not deep. <laughs> like always, like go out. It's it's so obvious that that's the gate. Like if it's like some Brad Pitt and a fuck it in Fight Club or like Tyler Darden or whatever, puts a gun to his back and said, "All right." It's over for you, buddy. Like, did some shit like that. He's like, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ready to give up all of it. And it's like, how deep, how deep is that then? <laughs> Come on, bro. Can't fool me. All right, let's continue. This distorted thinking stems from his Olympic gold medal because that's why the school relies on him and covers up for him. And that's how. He oh, see, the awards, the, the sense of value. His value comes from others. They're not even his. They're not even his, so how is that deep ingrained? That's pure social ego level. Ego level and shallower. You know, persona and super ego and that's just my notion of thing. Here we go. Or like that thing where you see some guy who's like, oh, I'm always smiling. Hey, I'm always having a good day and all that stuff and People are like, huh, see, really deep down, that guy's really an asshole. I've seen him do this one. No, 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 no. They're keeping that super forefront conscious of their mind. Yeah, they're not deep down an asshole. It's, they're just not that deep. <laughs> Period. <laughs> there we go. He's able to justify his actions. But once that source of the distortion is taken away, his palace is destroyed and his shadow is brought to the surface. And that's when he truly has to confront who he is. In the last cutscene with Shadow Kamashita, he even mentions that he's planning on returning to the Kamashita in the cognitive world. And I think this is why he only mentions that he thought of himself as a king in the cognitive world after the change of hearts. He literally didn't realize that he saw it that way until the shadow returned himself in the cognitive world. Looking at Kamashita's character arc, there was one aspect that I found to be interesting when thinking about the overall themes of the game. In the depths of Mentos, we see that he, like the rest of society, was locked inside the prison of regression and just like the phantom thieves he found his own individualism and prison. broke free from his prison, prison no longer wanting to have this nihilistic view of life but just like the other corrupted palace rulers he became overly indulgent in his own desires and instead of trying to change the system he abused it and took advantage of those who were still willing to be controlled i thought this was a pretty interesting parallel to the phantom thieves journey and is likely why they almost sympathize with him and the other palace rulers after learning this truth in mementos to the point that they even question their own morality for now i'd like to talk about about why these themes of rebellion and individualism are so important to portray in this game. The target audience is young people in Japan. Hashino, the director of the game, even mentioned that he was surprised by how well it was received in the West because it's so unapologetically Japanese. According to Hofstede Insights, Japan scores 46 on individualism, whereas the United States scores at 91. This means that Japan is a- What? You hear that? Japan scores a 46 on individualism, whereas the United States scores 91. This shows that Japan is a collective society, meaning they put group harmony above the expression of individual opinions. That is by far the dumbest shit. I you better come up with a different name for the category. Like for me, that's just like, it's damn near insulting. I don't know. Maybe it's just, I, I'm sure it's what they mean by the words. That That's the thing that's bothering me right now, but... I'm sure I might have a word for what they're saying, or what they're actually saying. Like, hey, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by individualism score? <laughs> and also scoring it itself is kind of like a, what? Excuse me? Here, your happiness meter. 
a collectivist society where more focused. I'm almost there, Discord. I'm almost there. Rather than individual ideas. So, for example, if a company was trying to incentivize their employees to work harder in Japan, it's more likely that there would be a group reward if they hit their goal. But in the U.S., it's more likely that the company would make it a competition and only award the person who gets the most done. I do want to clarify and say that it's not really a bad thing per se to be one or the other. They both have their benefits and fallbacks, just like anything else in life. But percent. Okay. I'm gonna stop it there because I gotta get, gotta get going. But uh, not bad. That's fucking interesting. They have all that in their uh, in a video game. It's not surprising, but it's like that's a lot. That's a lot of shit in there. Can't say I agree with all like the terminology and all that shit. But uh, other than like the like, we will probably disagree on ter on terminology. And also the notion of a you know, social score, uh, individualism score, uh, that sounds nonsensical to me. But other than that, it's like, that's interesting they're putting all those concepts in there. Uh, all right, so I'm going to link the video in the description box. Uh, so yeah, subscribe if you like, comment, agree, disagree. Tell me what you think about the ideas I put out, the ideas that are in the video. Do you have a different notion than both of us? You tell us, is there other video games maybe you recommend that have, uh, you know, have like any type of like something you find interesting or something deeper than just an on the surface notion of the world or, you know, typical plot storyline for a, a, for a video game. Let me know in the comments section. Don't forget to share, support, hopefully donate to all the links, all of them in the description box. If you ain't got money, you can at least share them. Please do so. Pick out your oh shit. Brought the mic down. Pick out your favorite one and fucking share it somewhere. And your favorite social media site. Do it. And also donate if you do have the money. <laughs> to those guys. Uh and with all that said, give this video a thumbs down.